Welcome to M Rapid 2023. Myself, Dr. Naveen Mohan, Associate Professor and HOD of Emergency Medicine at Amrita School of Medicine, Kochi. So let's discuss deep vein thrombosis today. So what is deep vein thrombosis? It is defined as the presence of a blood clot or thrombus in the deep venous system. Both deep vein thrombosis as well as pulmonary embolism form the spectrum of venous thromboembolic disorders and they are associated with significant mortality as well as morbidity. So the initial presentation to the emergency department will be with leg pain, swelling, edema, warmth, erythema and on examination you may even get pain on dorsiflexion of the foot which we call as the Homan sign. But we are actually not supposed to do a Homan sign if we suspect deep vein thrombosis because there are high chances that the, the thrombus inside the deep veins may become an embolus and this embolus can go to your lungs and cause a much more fatal complication which is called as the pulmonary embolism. So moving on to the differential diagnosis for deep vein thrombosis. Any patient coming to the emergency department with lower limb pain and swelling always rule out DVT first. The other differentials to be considered are ruptured popliteal synovial membrane or cyst, the Baker cyst, ruptured calf muscles or tendons, severe muscle cramps, cellulitis, this is important, cellulitis because that can cause sepsis, lymphedema, arterial insufficiency that can cause acute limb ischemia and even myositis superficial thrombophilbitis okay so basically you address deep vein thrombosis in the secondary survey of your uh, examination so that includes secondary survey includes taking an ample history followed by systemic examination right so a carefully taken history as well as an examination will help differentiate deep vein thrombosis from all these differential diagnoses for example, deep vein thrombosis or arterial insufficiency may have a very gradual onset of occurrence, which can be elicited in the history aspect, whereas in case of a musculoskeletal pathology, it will be mostly sudden onset following an exertion or something of that sort. And when you go to the examination aspect, you have to see whether there is any definite skin demarcation or whether the whether patient has got this uh, fever then that suggests mostly cellulitis and you'll have to start on early antibiotics and stuff whereas if there is pallor of the leg of, or if there is absent pulses sensory changes then think about arterial insufficiency so let's discuss the anatomy of the deep veins as you can see in the diagram this is the anterior tibial vein this is the posterior tibial vein peroneal vein all these join to form the popliteal vein which continues as the femoral vein which in turn is joined by the deep femoral vein the saphenous vein and forms the common femoral vein and the internal iliac vein join here and ultimately it forms the external iliac vein and so on so this part is the proximal deep veins and this part is the distal deep veins mostly confined to the calf so deep vein thrombosis typically presents in the lower limb and very rarely in the upper limb the venous anatomy of the leg predisposes itself to the formation of thrombosis low flow areas such as soleal sinuses or valve pockets and at venous confluences are the common sites of clot formation. The detectable clot is most commonly found in the anterior tibial vein, posterior tibial vein, as well as the peroneal vein. So this clot can then propagate proximally into the popliteal, femoral and iliac veins. 
okay so let's discuss the pathophysiology of uh, deep vein thrombosis uh, mr rudolph virchow reported the relationship between venous stasis a hypercoagulable state and endothelial vessel wall damage and the risk of thrombosis which we call as the virchow's triad okay so this is the virchow's triad and these are the risk factors under each heading underpinning the virtuous triad so hypercoagulable state vascular wall injury circulatory stasis so these are the factors which cause a hypercoagulable state if the patient has got his some history of malignancy if the patient is pregnant or even during the peripartum period if the patient is on some estrogen therapy if the patient suffered from recent trauma or surgery of lower extremity hip abdomen pelvis inflammatory bowel disease if he suffers from nephrotic syndrome if there is some kind of a sepsis or some thrombophilic states all these things will cause a hypercoagulable state this is important because in the history taking you will have to address all these questions in circulatory stasis the patient has got history of atrial fibrillation in ecg if there is a left ventricular dysfunction in in the echocardiogram if there is immobility or paralysis if there is venous insufficiency or varicose veins if there is a venous obstruction from tumor obesity or pregnancy so all these things can cause a circulatory stasis or venous stasis and vascular wall injury if there is a recent trauma or surgery that can cause a vessel injury if there is a vein puncture if there is a chemical irritation heart valve disease or replacement inflammatory bowel disease atherosclerosis in dwelling catheters is very important so all these things can cause a vascular wall injury so there exists an equilibrium between clot formation and clot breakdown a combination of these risk factors a combination of these risk factors if it favors clot formation then that will cause a deep vein thrombosis so basically the virtuous triad forms the basis for the pathophysiology of deep vein thrombosis the presence and combination of these factors may trigger the pathophysiological process that results in local cytokine production and facilitation of leukocyte adhesion to the endothelium you can just go through the diagram here and the standard treatment strategies for uh, deep vein thrombosis are determined by these factors these risk factors and are mostly centered on anticoagulation and the prevention of venous stasis if this condition goes unrecognized over time what happens is the thrombus subsequently organizes and inflammatory cells infiltrate into the clot resulting in intimal thickening and the wall thickens further over time and the likelihood of venous contractility increases as does the tendency to chronic venous insufficiency causing long term morbidity as well as increased risk of recurrence so let's move on to the clinical assessment of a suspected case of deep vein thrombosis usually patient presents to the emergency department with pain in approximately 50% of patients and maybe like swelling edema you can just see the diagram here the swelling edema usually unilateral and uh, maybe even warmth erythema in the affected calf there may be localized tenderness on examination and uh, at times uh, there may be pain in the calf upon dorsiflexion of the foot which we call as the homan sign but uh, it is often unreliable and is often present in calves even without dvts but if you strongly suspect a case of dvt never go and perform a home and sign because there are high chances that uh, the thrombus may dislodge and form an embolus and ultimately resulting in a pulmonary embolism and finally death a significant number of patients with deep vein thrombosis first present to the emergency department with respiratory symptoms and 50% of patients with proven pulmonary embolism are subsequently shown to have a deep vein thrombosis so first of all in clinical assessment you take a 
detailed history, symptoms, signs, and then you'll have to go assess the for risk factors, which I've already mentioned in the virtuous triad. So a careful history searching for relevant risk factors is crucial in determining appropriate strategy for investigation. These are combined with clinical features on presentation to form a formal risk stratification of patients with suspected DVT. So what are the investigation strategies? D-dimer, it's very important. You, any case of DVT, you take a history, evaluate the risk factors, do a clinical examination, okay, and then you do a D-dimer because it detects, what, what is a D-dimer? D-dimer detects fibrin fragments from clot degradation with a very high sensitivity, okay. So, however, its specificity is poor and D-dimer levels may be raised in any clinical condition in which clot turnover is increased, mainly infection, severe infection, it may D-dimer D -dimer may be increased, following a trauma D-dimer may be increased, following a major hemorrhage it may be increased. In cancer patients or in post-surgery patients, all these cases D-dimer may be elevated. But if D-dimer is negative, it rules out a deep vein thrombosis. There are different D-dimer assays which are in use in varying levels of sensitivity and specificity. So each test employs a different monoclonal antibody sensitive to a different part of the D-dimer molecule. So these are the assays used. Latex agglutination assays for D-dimer detection. ELISA, rapid ELISA and simply red D-dimer. So latex agglutination assays are older tests which are less accurate and no longer like recommended. ELISA is accurate but very much of very much uh, time consuming. There is something called as rapid ELISA which is accurate and it is a rapid version of ELISA. Then we have got the simply red D-dimer sensitive for proximal DVT which has got a very high negative predictive value. So there is no role for, you should note this point, there is no role for D-dimer in pregnant ladies, postpartum women and in also probably like IV drug abusers who are suspected to have a deep vein thrombosis as all these are very high risk groups and they require a definitive imaging. So this is one question that may be asked in some MCQs, especially for the MRK, MFRK and or SB and or they may ask this question pregnant ladies, postpartum women, there is no role, role for D-dimer. NICE now suggests an age-adjusted D-dimer test as D-dimer increases with age. This means for patients aged 50 and over, their threshold level should equate to either 10 times their age or 5 times their age, depending on the assay for D-dimer which is used locally. So the clinical risk stratification and use of the two-level Wells score. So the real value of the D-dimer assay is when it is used appropriately in conjunction with a pre-test probability scoring using a risk stratification tool. So the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE, recommends the two-level DVT Wells score. This is followed in the UK. So what is the two-level Wells DVT scoring system? You can just go through the slide here. You should understand that Wells score in DVT is different from Wells score in pulmonary embolism. Right. So you can just see how many points are there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There are 10 points. 10 points in clinical features, which includes both history as well as clinical examination. So if there is, the patient has got an active cancer, if there is an ongoing treatment within the six, last six months or even if it is palliative, it will give one point for that. If there is a paralysis, paralysis or recent plaster immobilization of the lower extremities, you give one point. If the patient has been 
recently bedridden for more than three days three days or major surgery within 12 weeks requiring general or regional anesthesia you give one point if there is a localized ten tenderness along the distribution of the deep venous system you give one point so this is this belong the first three belongs to the history aspect this one is examination if there if the entire leg is swollen you give one point this is also examination the inspection if the calf swelling three centimeters larger than the asymptomatic side which is measured 10 centimeters below the tibial tuberosity then you give one point if there is a pitting edema confined to the symptomatic leg you give one point if there is a collateral superficial veins which are non varicose which are non varicose you give one point if there is a previously documented deep vein thrombosis you give one point if there is an alternative diagnosis is at least as likely as deep vein thrombosis you give minus two points so all these points will have to be remembered only then you'll be able to calculate the uh, two level wells dvt score and the score is if the dvt is likely that means that if the score is two points or more two or more then the chances of this case being a dvt is very high okay so dvt is likely if score is two points or more dvt is unlikely if the score is one point or less so dvt likely means it represents higher risk with a pre-test probability of having a dvt of approximately more than 30 percentage before d dimer testing if dvt is unlikely it represents low or moderate risk with a pre-test probability of having a deep vein thrombosis less than 15 percentage So the only way to confirm, to definitely, definitively confirm the diagnosis of deep vein thrombosis is duplex ultrasonography. And imaging is required in those low risk, that means the DVT unlikely patients who have a positive D-dimer and in those at higher risk DVT likely cases. The occlusion of the vascular lumen is the major criterion for assessing the presence of clot in duplex ultrasonography but loss of the normal phasic signal from the venous blood flow also suggests the presence of occluding clot the sensitivity for duplex ultrasonography ranges from 97 percentage for proximal dvts to 73 percentage for distal dvts let's go through the previous slides i've mentioned what is proximal dvt what is distal dvt and all the clot more proximal to the inguinal ligament cannot usually be visualized on ultrasonography nice guidelines recommend that if the ultrasound is not available within four hours of being requested then the patient should be administered an interim 24-hour dose of parenteral anticoagulant until the scan is uh, available so where persistent diagnostic doubt remains alternative imaging may be required which may be a venography so this is one table which has been taken from the Arkham Learning website. The, whole, the entire slide has been prepared from Arkham Learning website and if for further information you can just check that website. So if the patient presents to the emergency department with a suspected DVT, assess the, uh, do the risk stratification with the two level Wells DVT risk score and if the score is two or more that means likely dvt it means likely dvt then definitely you don't no need to go go with a d dimer straight away do a duplex ultrasonography and if it is positive uh, dvt is confirmed and you can treat it accordingly with anticoagulants if it is negative but you still consider think that it is likely to be a dvt then you will have to do a d dimer and if the d dimer turns out to be positive then you stop an interim anticoagulation and repeat the duplex ultrasound scanning in six to eight days and if that turns out to be positive then dvt is confirmed and treatment anticoagulation but if it is negative then consider alternative diagnosis 
like cellulitis other diagnosis we can consider if the duplex ultrasound scan is negative and d dimer is also negative then also you consider an alternative diagnosis but if the wells score you say it's say suppose it is one or less that means unlikely to be a dvt one or less unlikely to be a dvt then no need to do a uh, ultrasound scan straight away you just do a d dimer testing okay and if d dimer is negative consider alternate alternative diagnosis and uh, treat it accordingly but if d dimer is positive do a duplex ultrasound scanning and if it is positive dvt is confirmed and if it is negative consider alternative diagnosis okay so dvt likely cases the first priority is for duplex ultrasound scanning dvt unlikely cases priority is for d dimer and depending on the values you can decide whether to go ahead with further investigations or and other less frequent imaging modalities include impedance plethysmography mri ct and venography impedance plethysmography is insensitive for non occluding thrombus calf thrombus or thrombus above the inguinal ligament it's a non invasive test mri uh, has got high sensitivity for uh, calf thrombus also for thrombus above the inguinal ligament when ct is not practical ct is uh, effective in the diagnosis of iliofemoral and more proximal thrombus but there are certain problems with contrast reactions radiation exposure and if there is a present presence of a metal implant especially in trauma like post surgery cases and all and uh, regarding venography it was previously the gold standard and this are this has now been replaced with the non invasive and less harmful techniques such as ultrasound so let's move on to the management of deep vein thrombosis management includes two aspects one is prevention aspect the other one is the treatment aspect especially with anticoagulation okay so moving on to the prevention aspect the thrombo profile axis so this diagram has also been taken from the arkham learning website so just see whether the patient is suitable for a protocol driven therapy that means the patient has got an nice got an isolated traumatic limb uh, injury suitable for ambulatory op care age more than 16 years or with any immobilization proposed if so if it is in the lower limb see if there is a transient risk of there is a transient risk of venous thromboembolism okay so these are the risks rigid immobilization a plaster cast non weight bearing status acute severe injury if it is any of if there is and the answer is yes to any of these then straight away go, go to see and see whether the, there is any permanent risk of venous thromboembolism and these are the uh, factors if the answer to any of these is yes then definitely the patient uh, requires a thrombo prophylaxis with a low molecular weight heparin provided there are there are no contraindications for lmwh so these are the contraindications for lmwh hemophilia thrombocytopenia recent cerebral hemorrhage or severe hypertension active peptic ulcer upper gi bleed recent major trauma hypersensitivity uh, gfr less than 30 ml per minute okay so you can just uh, go through this slide this is about the prevention aspect the thrombo profile axis whether whether thrombo profile axis is advised or not usually it won't be asked in exams so moving on to the treatment of dvt the definitive treatment of dvt in the emergency department warfarin this is important warfarin the oral vitamin k antagonist in the long term minimum 3 months treatment has to be given it inhibits 2 7 9 10 protein c s and z then you have got uh, the low molecular weight heparin lmwh or fondaparinex which can be used as a bridging therapy for the at least 5 days for the initial 5 days until the patient has achieved therapeutic anticoagulation so basically you start with warfarin as well as lm lmwh but lmwh usually will be discontinued after 5 days provided uh, an, a, a therapeutic anticoagulation is achieved that means INR more than two for 24 hours, whichever is longer, right? 
So that is the treatment. Nowadays, uh, some novel oral anticoagulants are being increasingly used and are now recommended as a viable option by new NICE guidelines for definitive treatment for those with confirmed deep vein thrombosis. Unfractionated heparin still has a role in patients with significant renal impairment and the dose is 5000 international units, then 18 units per kg per hour. APTT is 4 to 6 to 70 seconds. This is the target APTT. And there is uncertainty over the role of anticoagulation for isolated uh, below knee DVT, the distal DVT. Okay. The NICE guidance uh, recommends anticoagulation for proximal DVT, uh, which is defined as occurring in the, in the popliteal vein or above. Medium and long term treatment of deep vein thrombosis is the responsibility of GPs or ward based, ward -based doctors and not emergency physicians. And those with active cancer should receive long-term anticoagulation with LMWH for six months. This is important. Active cancer patients give long-term anticoagulation with LMWH for six months rather than warfarin. Why? Because of increased adverse effects of warfarin on cancer patients. A word regarding thrombolysis. NICE recommends the use of catheter directed, that is local thrombolytic therapy, for highly selected patients, specifically those with symptomatic iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis who have symptoms of less than 14 days duration. Symptomatic iliofemoral DVT who have symptoms of less than 14 days duration due to a thrombolysis. Also, the patient is, has got a good functional status and a life expectancy of greater than one year and low risk of bleeding. Aspirin is not recommended for treatment of DVT. Aspirin is not recommended. So regarding novel oral anticoagulants with NOAX, uh, this can be asked in a recent advances paper if, if, if a question on uh, DVT is asked. So these include uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban, which are direct inhibitors of factor 10A. Direct inhibitors of factor 10A. You can just see this X is there. Apixaban X is there. Rivaroxaban X is there. Okay. In direct inhibitors of factor 10A. So the NOAX have several advantages over warfarin. That means there are fewer drug interactions which leads to a more predictable anticoagulant effect and there is no need for regular blood tests for monitoring. So the treatment regimes approved by NICE include rivaroxaban 15 mg BD for the first 21 days followed by 20 mg OD. Apixaban will be 10 mg BD for the first seven days, followed by five milligrams BD. Then there is an alternative regime, which is LMWH for five days, followed by dabigatran or idoxaban. Uh, this can be asked for uh, in, uh, recent advances. Then the mechanical treatments includes compression stockings and vena cavil filters. Compression stockings aside from the prevention of DVT, are effective in reducing the effects of post-thrombotic syndrome. Post-thrombotic syndrome. And the current guidance is that, in addition to anticoagulation, patients are prescribed below-knee graduated compression stockings for at least two years, commencing one week following the diagnosis. And vena cavil filters, these are the management option in those patients not suitable for anticoagulation or who have recurrent venous thromboembolism despite long-term warfarin therapy, vena cavil filters. Early ambulation poses no risk for clot propagation and is encouraged, and the vast majority of patients with suspected or proven DVT can be investigated and managed as an outpatient as per the NICE guidelines. A word regarding the upper limb DVT, it is much less common than the lower limb but it presents with similar symptoms such as pain, swelling, increased circumference, warmth, venous prominence and tenderness, similar to lower limb DVT and risk factors include central venous catheters, malignancy, inherited or acquired thrombophilia, pacemakers, upper limb surgery or immobilization. So these things, have, risk factors have to, have to be considered in any suspected case of upper limb DVT while you take the history.
So the definite investigation includes venography or compression ultrasound. Optimal duration of warf ther warfarin therapy is unknown, but three to six months is associated with a low risk of recurrence. And bridging therapy with LMWH is required for at least the first five days, as same as with the uh, uh, lower limb DVT. So one word regarding the rare complications of DVT, which is Flecmasia carulia dolens, as well as Flecmasia alba dolens. Flecmasia alba dolens usually is characterized by white leg, especially a postpartum period. Flecmasia carulia dolens, it occurs as a consequence of extensive thrombotic occlusion of the major as well as the collateral veins of the leg. Thrombotic occlusion of the major as well as the collateral veins. So, usually affects the 50 to 60 year age group. Then cancer is the most commonly associated medical condition. The risk factors, malignancy, pregnancy, inherited thrombophilia, trauma and surgery. Clinical features, sudden severe leg, sudden severe leg pain. It's not a gradual, it's a sudden severe leg pain. Swelling, edema, cyanosis, arterial compromise, arterial com compromise and cyanosis. Okay, if you get a case of uh, low limb pain with swelling and swelling and cyanosis and arterial compromise and even compartment syndrome, think about uh, Flecmasia carulia dolens, which is a complication of deep vein thrombosis. So management will be conservatively with steep limb elevation IV fluids, IV heparin, 80 to 100 units per kg followed by 15 to 18 units per kg per hour infusion and several cases even require a catheter directed thrombolysis or surgical thrombectomy this is a diagram of flecmasia carulia dolens you can see the uh, synotic swelling as well as the synotic uh, limb so the key learning points of the session is uh, sessions are um, dvt is a common condition associated with, with significant morbidity and mortality the diagnostic strategy requires pre-test probability estimation of DVT with well scoring, the combination of pre-test probability scoring and the appropriate use of D-dimer assay will allow exclusion of DVT in about 40% of patients. The D-dimer assay is not appropriate in certain patients. This will vary dependent on the type of assay in use and the pre-test risk of DVT. Duplex ultrasonography is the standard, current standard imaging modality for the diagnosis of deep vein thrombosis and long-term sequelae can be reduced by early and appropriate treatment. Thank you.